put the okay <laughs> um then we can we can start okay so thank you very much for having me here so i will be talking about um wealth of effective field theories and the constraining power of swampland so i would like to introduce some of the prominent effective field theories that have been considered for cosmological implications and then i will discuss how you can use different um, theoretical consistency checks in order to um, discriminate among them. So before I do so, let me start with the standard cosmological model. We have this beautiful model. It's very simple and it's, it works very successfully. And it's based on general relativity, dark matter, dark energy, and the inflaton field. So as I said, even though this theory is very simple um, and works very well in explaining most of the observations, there are still some challenging relevant questions. First of all, what is the quantum nature of general relativity? Um, is it string theory or, or something else? Um, what is the origin of dark matter? Is it really like an additional particle or, or, or something else? And what causes these two accelerated expansion phases of the universe? responsible for the dark energy and the, and the inflaton phases. And is dark energy just a cosmological constant or a field evolving in time like the inflaton field? So in order to describe um, at least some of these ingredients, what people tend to do um, is either, either consider the following. You have general relativity plus some effective field theories or you might even consider in giving up on the idea of general relativity and you might even consider um, modified gravity, so non-GR. It doesn't matter in, in, in which, from which perspective you come, what you always face is that you add additional degrees of freedom. So these are like some additional scalar fields or additional vector fields. Sometimes even people have considered to introducing additional tensor fields like in bi-gravity type of theories. And so with the hope that one could describe um, some of these ingredients, if you are lucky or if you are ambitious, maybe you, you might try to solve uh, or explain all of these ingredients with just one extra field, but this is usually very difficult. So let me then start with the simplest scalar case. So let me introduce the effective field theory of a scalar field these are the Galileans and their construction follows the following uh, requirements. So you want your Lagrangian such that it gives rise to second order equations of motion. You have Lorentz invariance and locality. And due to historical reasons, um, you can also ask that it, it is invariant under this shift and Galilean symmetry. So, Demanding this, you can then construct the most general Lagrangians um, that satisfy these assumptions. And these are the Scalalian interactions written here. So you don't have to look at them in detail, but what you see is um, this scalar field um, appears with some additional, some second derivatives um, acting on it, with some traces of it. And these traces come in terms of some powers. And also you see in L4 and L5, these different operators, they have to go undergo some really fine tuning um, in order to satisfy this condition that you really just have one propagating scalar field and that you have second order equations of motion. So this is on flat space time. Um, you can also generalize that to curved space time in this case, you obtain this Hondensky theories um, that has been rediscovered uh, by covariantizing the Galilean uh, Lagrangians. And they have the following form. And naively, you could say, OK, I just take my Galileans and I replace partial derivatives by covariant derivatives. Of course, that's a um, good thing to do. <laughs> so you, you convert your partial derivative in covariant derivative but in L4 and in L5, you have to be careful and you have to add this non-minimal couplings to the gravity sector 
in order to maintain the requirement that you have second order equations of motion and that only three um, degrees of freedom propagate, namely the two from the metric and then the one from the scalar field. So if you don't have such non-minimal couplings in order to compensate this derivative interaction, you will end up having higher order equations of motion. And, uh, and if you are not careful enough, even some propagating ghost degrees of freedom that you don't want to have. So these non-minimal couplings um, then modify the gravity sector. So if your Lagrangian includes L4 and L5, you don't really have GR anymore, but you have uh, modified gravity. So if you want to apply this now to cosmology, it's uh, very easy to do that with a scalar field. Uh, you can construct homogeneous and isotropic solutions where the metric um, requires um, this simple form. You see that it only depends on a time dependent scale factor. And the scalar field has this um, um, background field configuration where it only has time dependence. And it's very easy in this way to construct cosmological solutions. So let me then um, move on to, to vector fields, to generalized Proca type of theories. Um, so there you do exactly the same thing. You demand that your effective field theory um, satisfies these conditions that you have second order equations of motion, Lorentz invariance locality, and three propagating degrees of freedom because it's a, it's a massive vector field. And in this way, you can then construct all the allowed uh, interactions. You again see that the vector field appears with some derivatives acting on it. And, and you see also that these operators, they have to again be tuned among each other in order to really have um, three propagating degrees of freedom for the vector field. Okay, you can also convert those interactions to curve space time. And then in this way, you have vector tensor theories. Um, so you, again, you have now covariant derivatives, of course, appearing. Um, and you see again in L4, L5, and L6, um, you have this non-minimal couplings to either the Ricci scalar, the Einstein tensor, or the double dual Riemann tensor in order to really have um, five propagating degrees of freedom and second order equations of motion. So two coming from the metric and three coming from the vector field. So um, again, this non-minimal couplings, they modify the gravity sector. So in the presence of this L4, L5, L6, you don't have GR anymore. Um, um, and concerning this interactions here in L5 and also in L6, they, um, they are a little bit special compared to the Galilean or the Hondansky case that I've shown you. Since if you take now this vector field and you look at its longitudinal mode, so if you replace a mu by partial mu phi, um, you will recover um, the Hordensky Lagrangians or the Galilean interactions. Um, apart from these additional interactions here, these are really pure intrinsic vector interactions. So um, they don't give us just to pure longitudinal um, interactions. So it was long believed that um, a single vector field is in tension with the cosmological principle that you cannot really construct homogeneous and isotropic solutions. And therefore that a single vector field would not be appropriate for dark energy applications. But um, with this generalized PROCA, um, the, the view has changed. So now with this effective field theories, you can construct with one single vector field um, homogeneous and isotropic solutions in which the vector field acquires a very simple, simple um, background uh, field configuration where you only have the temporal component that has a time, time dependence. So in this way, you can have a homogeneous and isotropic solutions. Imagine you have this very simple Lagrangian, just uh, as a part of this uh, generalized Broca theories where you have a kinetic term, where you have some general functions of the vector norm, 
or some even cubic type of Galilean type of interactions. With just this simple um, Lagrangian, it's very easy to show that you can have dark energy fixed points, so relevant for dark energy applications. And we were even able to show that it reduces the H0 tension and, and delivers a better fit to data than, than the lambda CDM model. So this is just to illustrate to you that with a single vector field, you can also construct homogeneous anisotropic solutions. So uh, you don't run into the problems of uh, anisotropies. So there are all these different models and different effective field theories. I have shown you just this, um, these two, uh, two examples. Um, of course, you could also consider a different type of models where even dark matter and dark energy interact or, or, or many more ingredients, many more degrees of freedom. So now one, one needs to do some consistency checks, to some, um, yeah, to put some constraints on this, on this different models. Here, I will be concerned concerning the theoretical consistency checks in parallel to the observational consistency check. So let me go through the theoretical consistency checks that at least in my opinion, uh, that should be done for any EFT that, that you want to apply in order to describe the universe. So for instance, concerning degrees of freedom, you have to make sure that this effective field theory has the right number of degrees of freedom. So if it's, if it's massive gravity, make sure it has only five degrees of freedom. If it's this Hondensky, it has only three. Then um, you apply this EFTs to some specific backgrounds, like right? so some cosmological backgrounds or, or maybe even for some black hole um, phenomenology. And when you consider perturbations on such backgrounds, make sure that your perturbations do not suffer from instabilities. And most of these effective field theories, they really suffer from ghost and gradient instabilities. So already at that level, um, it, it's hard to, to move on. So um, then there is the Swamp Land program where you try to put some constraints on the EFTs um, coming from the requirement that this EFT should be somehow embeddable into string theory. Um, so some sort of a quantum gravity theory and what are the implications for that? Then there are these positivity bounds. This is also very similar to, to, to the swamp land, slightly different. So you again want to have some UV complete theory and then, then you demand what are this, if I want this UV complete theory, what are the implications for my scattering amplitudes of my low energy effective field theories. And also concerning uh, quantum corrections. So this should be also checked because as you remember, I told you when you construct this effective field theories, all these operators and their, um, their uh, appearance, their coefficients, they really undergo really fine tunings. And, and you have to make sure that these tunings at the classical level do not receive large quantum corrections so that you don't detune um, these operators um, below, the, below the cutoff scale of your effective field theory. So let me go maybe through some of this um, consistency checks that have been already applied to, to some of these effective field theories. Concerning um, positivity bounds um, that you put on the scattering amplitudes. As I said, this comes uh, on, on your local Lorentz invariant UV completion down to your infrared effective field theory. And so by um, imposing this, this immediately then gives rise to positivity bounds on the scattering amplitudes, already at two to three level scattering amplitudes. So just here is an example to illustrate um, um, how powerful this is. Imagine you have this cubic and quartic Galileans in your theory with some coefficients G3 and G4. And you ask yourself, um, can this affect the field theory somehow be UV completed? And when you ask that and you look at the scattering amplitudes and apply the positivity bounds in order to, to achieve that, you see that there is a, a regime of these parameters G3 and G4 that has to satisfy this condition here 
in order not to have any problems to have such UV complete theory. So this is basically this, this white, white regime here. So you see the um, uh, imposing this uh, positivity bounds gives rise to additional conditions on the parameters of your low energy effective field theory that you should then consider on top of the constraints that you that you put using different type of cosmological observations. Another powerful um, program is this um, uh, soft bootstrap program. And so there by directly imposing a particular soft behavior of the scattering amplitudes, one can then classify um, all the different effective field theories and their hidden symmetries. So you don't even have to write down actually the Lagrangians, but from the behavior of the scattering amplitudes, you can reconstruct the Lagrangians and, and their involved symmetries. Just to again illustrate this to you, um, imagine you're interested in, in, the, in some scalar effective field theories. Probably the Lagrangian is of that form where you have a kinetic term uh, multiplied by a function of um, derivative to the power rho of pi on, of that scalar field. And as you see, rho is something like the power counting number. And so it characterizes the number of derivatives per interaction. And you can then now study the, the soft behavior of the scattering amplitudes. So you compute the scattering amplitudes and you send one of the external um, momentum to zero. And you look at how fast this amplitude goes to zero and how fast is basically um, in this parameter sigma here. So sigma is the, is the soft degree characterizing the power at which amplitudes vanish in, in, in the soft limit. So um, here's just an example again for this, for scalar effective field theories um, that I have taken here from this paper. So um, here is rho with respect to sigma. And you can see, you can then uh, in this way, classify all the different uh, scalar effective field theories so Galilean sits here, where rho is two and sigma is two. And when they actually did that, they, re they discovered this special Galileans, which had an enhanced soft behavior. So instead of sigma two, uh, it had sigma three. So um, that was really nice, nice thing from the soft uh, bootstrapping program that you, that, you that you discover actually new type of effective field theories with with enhanced symmetries. So let me mention this special Galilean a little bit more. So in the Galilean, as I said, you have this soft behavior uh, P squared and your Galilean has this um, shift and Galilean symmetry. And the special Galilean corresponds to the special um, subclass basically where L3 and L5 interactions are not present. And, and the L2 and L4, their parameters come in a, in a combined way. And so when you have the special Galilean, you have an enhanced soft behavior and the symmetry is enhanced in this way. So you have some nonlinear symmetries involved. So this shows how um, powerful this, this um, soft behavior um, is in order to you know, classify EFTs and also rediscover um, or discover some new symmetries. Okay, concerning the quantum corrections, as I said, this is also something very important to impose on your effective field theories. For the Galilean effective field theories, it's quite well known that um, they are stable under quantum corrections. So if you take the Galilean interactions and you compute Feynman loops, doesn't matter at one or two or three loops, um, what you observe is that all the counter terms that you introduce through the loops, they're always much, much suppressed compared to your classical interactions. And that this operators never takes the form of the operators appearing in your, in your um, classical Lagrangian. So these operators are not renormalized. And um, so the non-normalization theorem for the Galilean is, is quite well known. And uh, we were even recently uh, able to 
um, write down the one loop divergences in, in this very closed form in terms of some curvature invariance in terms of an um, effective metric. And this effective metric is given in terms of second derivatives acting on the scalar field. But you can basically now expand from this um, one loop effective action all the um, endpoint uh, end functions coming from your uh, one loop uh, contributions. So similarly also for the vector, uh, sorry, for the, for the Galilean with the broken shift symmetry. So imagine you could say, oh, Galilean is safe from quantum corrections probably because of the Galilean symmetry. So what would happen if you were willing to explicitly break the shift and Galilean symmetry? You would naively, naively maybe assume that this nice property of the quantum correction would probably be lost. And um, so we have looked at this in, in, in a very simple model where we are now introduced this additional uh, quartic interaction uh, that explicitly breaks the shift and Galilean symmetry. And, and, um, and we were able to show that even in the presence of this shift and Galilean symmetry breaking term, there is a similar non realization theorem. So um, all the one loop contributions, they generate operators that are completely suppressed compared to those one. And none of the generator generated operators have the form like those classical terms. They always come with, um, with more derivatives acting on them. So um, yeah, the same thing you can also um, show for the vector theories. Um, so this was also something that, that we have done. Um, I can just say, tell you that they are also stable under radiative corrections. So we have shown that for uh, just one loop contributions, but um, looking at the decoupling limit of this effective field theories, you can actually show that uh, the same property should be satisfied to any loops. Um, but yeah, we haven't explicitly showed it just to, to up to one loop. Okay. Um, so now uh, I would like also to introduce this um, swampland program that um, you are all very familiar with. Um, where you divide EFTs into the landscape and, and the swampland. And um, EFTs, of course, in the landscape can be successfully embedded into string theory. Um, and those in the swampland, they don't have a UV complete theory like string theory. And there are um, given conditions that you have to satisfy in order to hopefully not to land on the swampland. And um, so there are different um, conjectures that, <laughs> you're all experts on. So let me just um, maybe mention a few of those that are relevant for, for cosmology. So for instance, the Sitter conjecture, um, which basically tells you that it's very hard to get the cosmological constant from string theory. Okay, it depends to which community you talk to. <laughs> um, uh, I have given also a similar talk somewhere else. So some people do not agree with this statement, but I think you could agree that it's, it's at least very hard to get from string theory. Um, but it's very easy to get scalar fields from string theory due to some compactifications. Um, and they come with some, their, with some potentials and their potential have to satisfy this given, this given condition where C is an order of one parameter in, in Planck units. So you could apply that now for, for your favorite dark energy model. I mean, the simplest could be just a quintessence model, um, just to, to, as your reference, I mean, this quintessence model is just a simple part of this L2 Lagrangian in the Hordensky um, uh, effective field theories where you have just the kinetic term and then a potential. So um, you can combine now this decisive conjecture together with uh, all the available um, cosmological observations like supernovae, BAO, uh, CMB, and local H0 measurements. And in this way, put some constraints on, on your dark energy, well, in this sense, the quintessence model. So you are standing between these two situations. Either dark energy really is cosmological constant, like the observations keeps telling you it's a cosmological constant, then string theory has to, has to get it. 
in a in an easy or complicated way. Or dark energy really turns out to be a scalar field, then this the situ conjecture can be used in order to have some additional constraint on the parameters of your theory. So here is just uh, for illustration purposes, this is the equation of state parameter uh, with respect to redshift um, for just the exponential quintessence model with an exponential potential. So this lambda is basically the C factor here. And you see that um, um, you can then start pushing with the, with the current observ observations here, um, the values lambda well down to, to 0 0.8 or whatsoever. And you see with the Euclid um, precision that we will have, you can push that even, even further um, to very small values, this C. Um, yeah. So you could also apply this, for instance, to the Hondansky model. Um, just again, for illustrative purposes, imagine you have now this subset of the of the Hondansky with this very given specific functions um, in this Lagrangians. And uh, you can do the same thing, combine these two constraints and, and put bounds on the, on the parameters of your theory. So this lambda again is the C and the alpha um, is coming in your, in, in this general functions. Surprisingly, so now, because you have on top of the potential, you have derivative interactions of that scalar field which has a huge influence on the background evolution of that scalar field. Um, the De Situ conjecture actually uh, introduces um, tighter constraints um, on, on, on this Hondanska model, which, is, uh, which supposedly has more, more operators and, and should be actually, um, um, yeah, should have it easier to, to satisfy the constraints. But actually it doesn't work the way, that way. So um, let me also mention the Transplankian censorship conjecture. So that's also very relevant for cosmology, as you can imagine. So um, it, it, it states the following. So a field theory consistent with a quantum theory of gravity does not lead to a cosmological expansion where any perturbation with length scale greater than the Hubble radius trace back to the Transplankian scale at an earlier time. Sure, but perturbations um, uh, originate from scales beyond the um, Planck mass, your effective field theory breaks down, so you cannot use it. So this is the, this is the condition that your cosmological model has to satisfy. You can rewrite it also in this integral form, uh, which is actually better for cosmology, especially if it concerns dark energy. Because, um, because of this large <laughs> difference between the Planck mass and the, and the um, Hubble function at final uh, time, um, at a given time in the dark energy evolution, this would be very easy to satisfy. But it gains a constraining power when you, when you cons consider uh, an evolution uh, within a time period. So for instance, if you look at, um, today dark energy model, and then you look at the future evolution, this is going to allow you to, to put tight constraints. So as I said, no implications for observations of today, but um, it immediately tells you that you cannot have the situ attractors and um, the situ attractors would be in direct disagreement with this transplankian censorship conjecture. So what does it mean in terms of a uh, specific model? Here I am just showing uh, one specific model within this uh, vector, vector type of dark energy models um, where this vector field gives rise to dark energy with a phantom-like behavior where the equation of state is smaller than minus one. So this is your attractor. And because this attractor is not a desitter attractor, so with omega equals to minus one, um, it, it, it satisfies the Transplankian censorship conjecture. But if your dark energy model happens to be um, something which has uh, as an attractor omega equals to minus one, this would be then immediately ruled out by, the, by this conjecture here. Similarly, also for the, um, for the dark energy model based on the scalar field, like the quintessence type of field, 
There you have a dark energy fixed point um, with equation of state parameter bigger than minus one. So again, here in this case, you are safe since the future fixed point is not a is not a Sitter attractor. So, but this gives you an additional con constraint that you have to satisfy. Okay, and just one quick uh, comment on the H zero tension. So this type of the uh, quintessence models they worsen the the H zero tension, but this type of vector dark energy models they they help with the H zero tension. Um, due to the fact that behave, that they behave like a quantum like dark energy. Um, so Cumbrian himself, they, they, so they, they have a model where you have an interacting quintessence with dark matter. And there uh, the claim is that you might um, make this tension actually better than, than in just simple, simple um, quintessence model. Okay, there's also this um, distance conjecture. Um, that you have to impose also this condition on the values that the that the scalar field um, takes in the entire evolution of, of this cosmological evolution that you are considering. So to summarize, you have the distance conjecture, which basically tells you the, the range um, traversed by the scalar fields within the domain of validity of the effective field theory. That is one constraint. Then you have the Sitter constraint that put constraints on the slope of a positive potential. And then you have this Transplankian censorship conjecture and that tells you about the duration limit of, of any phase of accelerated expansion. Okay, so since I, I'm running out of time, I, I, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Alina. It's a very nice talk. Um, so uh, if, uh, I'm sure there are questions. So um, you, you can, this kind of symbol with a hand, <laughs> uh, if you have a question uh, to ask. Uh, OK, so, so Miguel, uh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks a lot for a very nice talk. So I, had, I just had a simple question. So in this model where, the, where, where, you, where you basically have the dark energy as a broker field, what is the mass of the, of the, of the photon? Yeah, if, if you want to use it for dark energy, then the mass has to be, um, as usual, um, has to be of uh, H0, so the Hubble, the Hubble parameter today, yeah. So it, we could- so It's very small. Right, right. So could, could we identify this guy with the actual photon? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> that's a very good question. Actually, the constraints on the, on the, on the mass of the graviton, <laughs> is even tighter constraint than the mass of the photon. <laughs> so um, I think the, the constraints on the mass of the photon is um, up to 10 to minus 20 EV, mm -hmm. something like that. And this guide would be around minus 32, something like that. I see. Okay. But nice. yeah, I, I don't have the photon in mind. It, it's probably something additional. Okay, very good. So, uh, does it order the hands on the chat? Okay, so Joe, Joe has a question. I think. Yeah, um, I was just try, uh, uh, trying to understand something from several slides uh, uh, previous. There was uh, th there was a um, there was a diagram that uh, for the soft scatter uh, for soft scattering, and there was like a trivial soft scattering region, a forbidden region, and a number of the models were kind of like in this like marginal space, like looked like they were just on the boundary between these different regions. And I was just curious what that what that means. Like, do they do they actually exist to one side, uh, one side of that line, or are they somehow like? Yeah, exactly. So if 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 you are here um, on that side, then you know you if if you want to have Lorentz local UV completion, and so you have you know uh, unitarity requirements on your scattering amplitudes, then this regime is forbidden. Yeah. And this one, you have so many. Um, you have so many derivatives per field that you have actually trivial soft behavior. So as soon as you take any um, momentum of the external going to zero limit, they will immediately vanish. So 
um, th th so this is the reason why um, you don't consider this this regime. Yeah. And but uh, but both of these like both of like the the Galilean uh, uh, points on there are kind of like. Uh, look like they're they could be on the boundary between like the white and blue regions or the white and uh, red regions and I was just curious like do they actually fall within the uh, the white region there or are yeah, they yes, they are in the white in the, in the white because they have only two derivatives per field if you were in the blue one you would have more derivatives per field than the two okay thank you <laughs> Very good. So uh, I think next we have Irene. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Lavinia. I was just following Miguel's, uh, Miguel's question. I was wondering about this photon mass. Well, not photon, but like this vector boson mass. Mm -hmm. How do you compare? Like, I'm not very sure how the vector field gets a mass, if it's with a Stuckelberg coupling or what. But if it's with Stuckelberg, have you compared it with works like for example, from matrix using the weak gravity conjecture and this conjecture constraining that the mass cannot be too small. Whether yeah, so so you are wondering how you would then make the photon massive without running into into problems with all the observations that we have. Is that the no, I mean there, if you take some swamp plan conjecture like the weak gravity or the distance, you mm -hmm. can put a bound on how small the mass of a vector field can be if the mass appears because of a Stuckelberg mechanism. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you are basically relying on having the gauge field or gauge symmetry involved, um, then you can apply this, this um, conjecture. Um, but as you know, the gauge symmetry is just redundancy. So I can imagine that you could write this PROCA in terms of um, the Stuckelberg field as like a gauge um, invariant theory, where the Stuckelberg field has to change in a, in a very you know specific way, and then on the um, on yeah re rewritten the theory in this way, you could try to apply the constraints coming from the weak gravity conjecture. But this is going to be satisfied anyway, because for the cosmological um, uh, applications that we are interested in, uh, the gravity will be always weaker than the, than the other force. Well, there are some constraints on the mass that appear, but maybe uh, let me ask you, if it's, it's like a Higgs mechanism or like a Stuckelberg mechanism? You, you can also construct the Higgs mechanism for this, yes. Then that's the way out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can also, so in, in, in difference to massive gravity for this uh, generalized PROCA, it's very easy to construct the Higgs mechanism. You start basically with this additional, um, additional scalar fields in there. And then uh, through spontaneous symmetry breaking, you exactly get this derivative interactions. Very good. So, uh, more questions? Uh, yes, Gary has a question. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> since you showed earlier to Joe this plot with uh, several theories that will lie at the boundaries, uh, one of them is the P of X type theories. Yes. Uh, if I understand what you meant, these are theories with uh, which are functions of the kinetic term. Yes, yes. Right. So then DBI inflation would fit into that types of theory. So I don't know what you meant by having two dots that are on different locations in this plot. Yeah, but DBI, DBI is a special special case because it has an additional symmetry. And because of the square root structure, it has a better um, soft behavior in the same way as the special Galilean has a better soft behavior compared to the Galilean. So if you want, the P of X is a more general class, um, but the DBI is a subclass with more enhanced symmetry and better soft behavior. Right, but, but uh, among the P of X theories, I think many of them should be in the swampland because they could lead to superluminal uh, propagation. So um, I'm surprised that you could still have it within the, the white band. So, some of them, I believe, would be would be consistent, but some of them lead to 
um, problems. Yes, yes. I, I guess if you if you take P of X and you look at specific backgrounds and you look at perturbations on such specific backgrounds, for some coefficients of these parameters, you will have superluminal propagation, probably. Um, but that would be really um, on top of such concrete background that you are considering. So in this analysis, they, they don't do that, right? They, they just look at all the possible um, scattering amplitudes that is uh, compatible with, with your Lorentz invariance and, um, and that's it. But you could put additional constraints coming off those studies that you are mentioning. Okay, thank you. Very good. So any more questions? We have still three minutes. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I can ask a question. I don't know if nobody, if, if, if you have a question, if you can put your hand up if you have a question. If not, then I can ask about this uh, Galileo, uh, the, con the constant, the shift symmetry by constant. Yeah. Uh, is that, is, that uh, is the idea that th is this supposed to be an exact, an exact shift, shift symmetry? Or because it looks like a kind of global, it looks like a global symmetry that you wouldn't expect to be ever exact in quantum gravity. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, this this is a global this is a global symmetry, and actually it is satisfied up to boundary terms. So but, uh, isn't that uh, I mean, if since we if we are mentioning about the Sonplan, the absence of global symmetries is perhaps one of the strongest strongest uh, motivated Sonplan constraint. So yeah, would you yeah, but theories with with such a global symmetry to exist. Oh. Yes, but you could you could maybe you could associate these global symmetries to some gauge symmetries in your high UV theory, and that's just a remnant in 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 your in your law of energy. I mean, in the standard model, we have also global symmetries, um, but they yes, are but we them to be. Yeah, I mean, you can gauge you can gauge the symmetry. Exactly, you are. Oh. This is supposed to be a um, you know gaugeable in your UV theory, so. It, it, it depends on-, on it's, a, it's a continuous symmetry. You cannot gauge a continuous symmetry. I mean, you could gauge a discrete symmetry, but I mean, you, you would not have a continuous remnant. Like, you know, if, if you gauge a continuous group, you typically have yeah. a massless particle. I mean, of course you can, you can gauge a discrete group, but- I So you are, you are saying you, there is no way that you could, um... Uh, associate that to a given gauge symmetry in your in your in your high UV theory. Well, I mean, like for example, in string theory, we have like axions that have classically a shift symmetry, but it has to be it, it is broken to a discrete gauge symmetry by non-perturbative effects always. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is that once you break the symmetry, then you have couplings which are not derivative-like. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you showed very nicely in, in your slide that if you add derivative couplings like pi squared, you break the full Galilean symmetry, but you still keep the shift symmetry. And then the mass of the scalar is still protected. But if you break the shift symmetry, then it's hard to see how a scalar could stay massless because it couples to some other fields. And then when you integrate them out, you expect to get a, a mass for it. That's, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I, I think it would be nice to understand if there's a way to, to obtain such a, an exact shift symmetry from a quantum theory of gravity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I see. Well, if not, then even better, you could then forget about this theories. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, I think that's one that perhaps the, the most immediate some plan constraint to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any, any more questions? And um, if not, then let's uh, go back to, thank you very much for the talk. Let's thank, thank Lavina again. Thank you for the.